So today I'm doing non-HPB breast and colorectal malignancy. And at the very end, I'll give you guys a quick little potpourri. Um, just, you know, as far as copyright, because this is education, there are things that were taken for some textbooks, the NCCN, and even a little borrowing from the podcasts of uh, Behind the Knife, which actually is much, much better if you guys need last minute stuff than the Absite Slayer. I had looked at that, um, at least the second edition. There's a lot of errors in it. So if you guys have that, I would just lay off of that. So we'll do melanoma quickly. So again, the ABCDEs, um, these you guys should be all familiar with. And then there's always what we call the ugly duck, which is the hidden F, the WTF, which is really what the, what the dermatologist is looking for, which is the ugly duck out of the line. So again, history and physical, pretty standard. Again, you wanna know the phenotype of the person. For the absite UVB, is the one that actually is causing the damage. So UVA makes you look old, but it's the UVB that's the deeper penetrance that actually is carcinogenic. Um, there are some people who have dysplastic nevus syndrome. Um, and again, if you have large congenital nevi, you have up to 10% lifetime risk for melanoma. Other risk factors, if you've had other skin cancer, if you're immunosuppressed, um, about 10% can be a family history and there's a couple of different genetic syndromes that are associated with that um, and then xeroderma pigmentosum which again you guys should remember more for squamous cell the subtypes again if they ask you what's the most common is the answer is going to be superficial spreading um, this is kind of the classic trunk on the men back of the legs on women if if you get a question like that um, lentigo maligna melanoma, not to be confused with lentigo maligna, which is actually just melanoma in situ. That's the head and neck, older male, elderly one. Um, lots sometimes, you know, just clinically, you know, these can be pretty difficult to clear. So here you can see this is a field defect. We've had patients with a field defect the entire size of their chest. So, um, but again, that's more associated with chronic UV exposure versus superficial spreading. You can think of that as a, that high burst intermittent sun exposure. Nodular melanoma, these are the ones clinically that I would say that we worry the most about. These tend to behave more aggressively, have a high mitotic rate, or usually deeper at the time of presentation. So for example, yesterday I had a gentleman who did not have any clinically palpable lymph nodes two weeks ago and had one by the time that we brought him to surgery for a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So these things can be um, be incredibly aggressive. Um, and that's just something more for your clinical knowledge. The nodular ones are the ones that are raised. Acral melanoma. Acral melanoma is an entirely different disease genetically, how it behaves, how it responds to immune therapy. It's kind of lumped in with melanoma. And the other thing, again, for your personal knowledge, they're not going to ask you on the app site. We think probably the ones that are underneath the, the nail bed actually probably behave different than the ones that are truly on the palm or in the foot surface. And, and that's some newer research that's, that's going on. Now, they're still more common if you look at the total number in Caucasians. But if you look at melanoma amongst Hispanics, Asians and blacks, that's the most common type of melanoma in those populations. Um, there's some things called a Hutchinson sign. Again, I doubt they would ask that on the app side. That's if you actually just have a stripe as opposed to here, where you see the pigmentation extend actually into the male bed. You can actually see it over here as well, right? That's that's pathognomonic. And again, a lot of times this will be in the setting of someone thought they stubbed their toe and it just never got better, and that's how they'll be called to attention. So the eighth edition, again, melanoma had a new updated staging probably now about uh, three, four years ago. The two most important things are always thickness and ulceration. Again, for your app site, the only things that are important um, really are not looking at these A and B categories, but just your thicknesses. Again, with everything that you guys are doing, just remember, you know, if you've got four things, only memorize two, right? So remember a T3 is from two to four, right? And a T1 is less than one, right? And as when you look at that, that's due to the depth. And again, for your oral boards or for your ab site, still the answer, for the American Board of Surgery is gonna be that you wanna punch or you want an excisional biopsy with a three millimeter margin. 
for diagnosis. Um, we can talk at, if someone is really interested in melanoma about a shave versus a liptoid excision that just happens to be done with the same type of a, an instrument as one does with the shave biopsy. But a biopsy to be complete, you want to excise the entire specimen and you want to get down deep in the dermis or into the fat. Okay, so that you make sure that they've been staged. But again, thickness, ulceration, two most important things for melanoma. Now, the reason why you need to know the if it's a the depth, right, and how that correlates with the T stage is just for margin assessment. Again, it's not uncommon um, either on your boards. I don't remember being asked this on the app site, but again, this is kind of uh, something that's just clinically important that you should know. Um, you know, if it's one or less, one centimeter, one to two, it's really dealer's choice, um, anywhere from one to two. If it's greater than two, then it's a two centimeter margin. And all of these information about margin assessment is all based upon randomized clinical control trials. So indications for Sentinel Note, again, had changed. So again, some of the textbooks may not be up to date, but the SSO ASCO guidelines that were uh, published about three years ago had some changes. So the most important thing for any study, no matter what you're doing as a doctor, if a patient's medically unfit or you're not going to act on any of that additional staging information, don't do a procedure. Don't order a test. So if you have a 95-year-old and is not going to qualify to get adjuvant treatment, don't put them under general anesthesia and check something if they have a clinically negative node exam, okay? Now, for those patients where the lymph node risk is less than 5%, those are patients with a Breslow thickness, these are your T1A patients, less than 0.8 millimeters without ulceration based on the AGCC8. There was, again, just for your knowledge, if you're taking care of a melanoma patient, if you saw a mitotic rate, that was greater than or equal to two, just keep that somewhere in the back of your mind if any of you guys wind up going into oncology. Those patients are different, okay, particularly if they're young. Um, the, the guidelines aren't as detailed probably as they should be, and my guess is with the next edition of the AJCC, you'll see that as a change. The ones that you should consider are if it's thin, anytime it's ulceration, just do the central node biopsy, okay? Again, I don't know if they'll ask you that on the app site, but in real life, just do it, trust me. Um, the controversial areas between 0.8 and 1 millimeter, up until a few years ago, the recommendation was not to do that. But again, there's probably some subtypes that benefit, and these are for ones that are not ulcerated. These are the T1B, and that's a current gray area and controversial. So anyone who's taking their oral boards, if you got asked about that, you know, later this year, you would say that you'd have a discussion. Um, and then you would, you know, again, if there was a high mitotic rate, do it. If it was low or the patient's elderly, probably don't need to do it. Sentinel node biopsies should be done clearly between one to four millimeters, right? Because they are risk, it's um, almost by thickness. So we usually think about one millimeter, 10%, two millimeter, 20%. When you get to about three or above, you're at a 30 to 40% risk. And then it's a considered category for those that are four millimeter thick. Um, our practice at Yale is actually to offer those because if that has a positive sentinel lymph node, it upstages patients from a stage two to a three. Um, about a month ago, they actually approved adjuvant therapy. So, so these recommendations too may be in flux. But again, right, there's just what's in green here. Just commit this to memory because that's really the important thing in case you're asked on your app site. The other things that are important, again, is the DCOG and MSLT2 trials, which were practice changing. So previous to these, if you had a positive sentinel lymph node, you would recommend a, a completion lymph node dissection. That means you saw the patient in clinic, you felt all of their lymph nodes, you didn't feel any enlarged lymph nodes, you did a sentinel node, and then those patients... Um, Currently, we do not recommend that they get a completion lymph node dissection because it actually did not show a benefit in disease-specific survival. Um, if you're asked, 
Again, you should be doing serial nodal ultrasound, whether or not at your center you do that in practice. We actually don't do it in our practice. Those patients usually are at high enough risk that they wind up getting cross-sectional imaging. But again, for the purposes of the ABS, and that interval is four months. Okay, so you'll see like a four to six months interval that you would recommend that the patient get ultrasound. If they have a positive sentinel lymph node, you'd refer them to a medical oncologist for consideration of adjuvant treatment. And that's a really, really fair game question, potentially on your app site, but particularly on your oral boards. Remember, if you have a clinically palpable lymph node, right, that's called doing a therapeutic lymph node dissection. Those patients are not part of MSLT2 or DCOG. So again, more for oral boards, totally fair game. Or if there was an abside question, a patient presents with a clinically palpable lymph node, you're going to do a therapeutic lymph node dissection on those patients. Um, I don't think that they'll go into super challenging depth, but that would be kind of wh where you would go. Um, if you had an option to stage them, you'd probably want to do that first in real life and, and probably for answer on your app site. So adjuvant therapy, again, this is a little bit more of an FYI. Um, you can give adjuvant ipilimumab, actually not done anymore. Most people will just get adjuvant either, either nivolumab or pembrolizumab, which is the anti-PD-1. Um, again, I had mentioned just last month, there's a new approval for stage 2B and C. Super controversial. Oh, sorry, guys extra either. Um, if someone has a BRAF V600E, okay, and that may be something that may be fair game on the, on the test. E has the most response. K will also respond. If there's any other mutations that you see with melanoma, it will not respond to the BRAF MEK inhibitors, and you need both of them. There's a combination of a, a couple of different agents. You may just want to look them up so that you know how they end um, to know if they're in the class. But usually you're always going to want to choose something that's a two-drug regimen. One of them ends in inib, okay? If they ask about, you know, who does worse, right, lung patients, do better. Those are usually M1Bs. Livers are M1Cs. Brain is M1D. Those do the worst, and liver equally does terrible. Melanoma is the most common metastasis to the small bowel, um, in case that that came up as a question. And those, those patients actually, by the way, do quite well if you resect them, regardless of immunotherapy. There's always one or two questions about either basal or cutaneous squamous cell. Now, interestingly, when we look at these, they are the highest cancers known to mankind. They're number one, but they're not recorded in tumor registries. So if you actually, just as an aside, look at the burden of death from cutaneous squamous cell cancer, it actually is higher if you look at the absolute number of people who die than for melanoma. Um, so again, I think during the course of your training, I think we're going to see some evolution in this. Head and neck has a, has a staging system, but for extremity, we don't even have a staging system if you look at the NCCN. So anyway, millions of people um, have this, usually a million a year for each of those types. Generally speaking, you'll excise these with three to five millimeter margins. If you had a question, if there were features, if it was greater than five centimeters, if it's greater than two centimeters in the head, if you see perineural invasion, or if you saw poorly differentiated, that would be an indication for potentially doing either a sentinel node, and that's for your own knowledge. They won't ask you that because this is too up to date to be included on the boards. But if they said, you know, what are high risk categories? Um, the other high risk category for a squamous cell would be in the cases of a margillin's ulcer. For example, that's a common question, the chronic non-healing wound. The other group of people that they may ask you about is your patients for transplant. The highest risk of malignancy is cutaneous squamous cell. Okay. Now, squamous cells in general, 4 to 5% are metastatic. Um, again, we discussed they can behave heterogeneously, um, lots of different factors. Basal cell carcinoma, lowest risk, um, again, Resection is the primary. Um, Vismotigib or sinitigib, um, those are hedgehog inhibitors, um, and you can treat people off-label with immune therapy. But the hedgehog inhibitors for basal cell and a patch one mutation, those all fit together, um, and something called Gorlin's syndrome. 
The other kind of um, disease that people talk about that has one of those names that comes up with when you have lots of squamous cell, that's also known as Bowen's disease, not to be confused with Bowen's syndrome, okay? Again, history and physical for keratinocyte um, malignancies are very similar to what you would ask. Um, again, Gorlin syndrome, basal cell carcinoma, these patients are covered in basal cells. Um, it's really, uh, really scary. Um, now I'll pause. Any questions about cutaneous malignancies before I move on to sarcoma? Or Sean, do you want me just to wait till the end? I, th I think you can keep going and if questions come up, uh, just enter them in the chat box. Okay. So sarcomas, um, over 80 different subtypes, again, derived from mesenchymal cell origin, right? So soft tissue, bone, connective tissue. Um, again, here's the, the whole kind of family of them and the they like to reclassify them every couple of years and change the names if taking care of these wasn't hard enough already. If you look about about 12,000 cases a year, about 5,000 deaths occurs equally between men and women. And unfortunately, we also see it in young patients. Those are most of the bony ones that you'll see, like rhabdosarcoma, um, osteosarcoma. Those would be some of the more common ones that we see in that population. Again, the most common types of sarcoma, it's liposarcoma, regardless of location, okay? Particularly in the abdomen, that's the highest one. Lyomyosarcoma inside the belly is the second highest versus kind of, if you group everything together in the extremity of these malignant fibrous histiocytomas and undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas, if you clump those together, but again, lyomyosarcoma is, is pretty close um, even in the extremity. Um, synovial cell sometimes becomes a favorite, um, particularly for boards and so forth, uh, just because it's really treatable. It has a translocation. It, there's a bunch of different therapies for it. And it's also one of the ones that can go to lymph nodes. So it's one of those unique um, cases. And I'll tell you the, the mnemonic to know for, for sarcoma. You know, desmoid, again, make sure that you know it's associated with FAP. Um, you'll have patients really don't die from their colon cancer anymore of FAP. Gastric cancer becomes the second most common extra um, colonic tumor in those patients, except for women, were endometrial. But again, desmoids are associated with those patients. And again, for you guys, don't sweat um, if they ask you a sarcoma question. Hopefully, they'll kind of keep it to the liposarcoma. Liposarcoma, super important. That would be um, something they can ask. The mutation is MDM2 amplification, okay? That is something that would be fair game for them to add ask you, and probably one of the more fair game questions aside from just questions on your app site. So again, a lot of times you get all of the, the questions on your app site about risk factors and genetic syndromes. They like to ask that because those are facts, right? So as far as soft tissue sarcoma, right? Radiation associated angiosarcoma. Um, if we look at lymphedema, that's the Stuart Trivis syndrome that's associated with angiosarcoma. So that's the question, the radiated breast cancer patient with lymphedema, right? So that's gonna be an angiosarcoma. And again, the APC, desmoid, Lefrau mini. So they ask you about a young patient presenting with a sarcoma, right? You wanna look for that P53 mutation in those folks, um, neurofibromatosis, right? They get those neurofibromas. And they a lot of times will have benign nerve sheath tumors that can turn into malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, and then just becomes another important one to know for type 1 neurofibromatosis. These other ones over here, um, except for Gorlin with the patch mutation, again, just for that one, think about basal cell. If they ask you about that in sarcoma, I think that would be fairly unfair. Again, liposarcoma, the MDM2, okay, mutation that's actually what we use and, and you have that sent out to actually solidify that diagnosis. Um, 
These are just up here more for kind of general knowledge. For GIST though, you need to know CKIT or the PDG FRA mutation. That you need to know. You get asked that every single year and I'll talk about GIST in just a minute. So again, extremity sarcoma workup. I remember there always being a question on the app site about an incisional biopsy, excisional biopsy, um, or core needle. So again, if you can with these, you're gonna do a core needle biopsy and you're gonna have it set up such as that you would be able to excise the tract. Do not do an incisional biopsy. You guys all have to promise me for your whole life, except in extremely rare conditions for an extremity sarcoma, you actually can hurt a patient. So um, do not choose incisional biopsy and do not do that um, as, as you are going into practice. It's better to do a, a close margin um, excisional biopsy. Those patients, if, if you look even at studies that are done over, you know, again, you'd prefer to do it the right way the first time, but those patients do better. If you do an incisional biopsy, you can mess up margins, you can seed, okay? Um, the workup is typically for extremely going to be an MRI. Um, this is just some fun facts about certain types. Again, you hear me tell it, forget about it for your app side, but some uh, mixoid liposarcoma, those are super unique and they can metastasize anywhere where you have fat. Um, so, you know, you're, if you think about areas of lymph nodes, it doesn't go to the lymph nodes, but it'll go to those fat pads. It can go to the retroperitoneum. It can go to your bone marrow. Uh, so those are a very unique group of patients. So if you see that in practice, again, you want to get those to a specialty center. Um, again, abdominal and pelvis, because usually you think about chest scans for most sarcomas, epithelioid, angiosarcoma, and leiomyosarcomas, they really can go anywhere in the body versus, you know, if you think about most uh, sarcomas, like osteosarcomas, for example, those are ones you're going to think of. You're just going to get your non-con scans of the chest. And actually those patients, you can keep them around with metacetectomy. The scare, I don't think they would ask you for this um, on your app site, but could be something on the boards. Um, the acronym is SCARE, so synovial, clear cell, angiosarcomas, rhabdomyosarcoma, and epithelioids. So those are the little blue cell tumors. Those are ones that actually have the highest incidence of lymph node metastases, high enough that you should think about um, in real time, in real practice, you know, at least doing some, you could do some nodal imaging, you could do a sentinel node. Um, they wouldn't ask you probably about that management either on your boards or for this, um, only if you were taking surgeonc boards. But again, synovial clear cell, angiosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and epithelioid can go to the lymph nodes. They're very unique in far, as far as sarcomas. So again, stage them. You know, um, you consider doing chemotherapy first if they're high grade, um, and then um, you know greater than five to ten centimeters. Um, again, I, I don't think that they're going to ask you this portion over here. That's just for general knowledge for today. And then again, um, to make matters more confusing, and I hope that they would not ask you guys um, on your app site about the staging for sarcoma. Um, GIST has a separate staging system. Dermatofibrosarcomas have a separate staging system. Extremity versus the retroperitoneum versus some of the other types of sarcomas all have their own separate staging system. Um, the things, though, that are, are important just for you for clinical knowledge, right, how big they are is important. Their differentiation, which is graded by the pathologist, that's important. Their mitotic rate is important and the presence of tumor necrosis. So I, I don't think that they would ask you to stage that, but if they asked you a question about, um, you know, a sarcoma and, you know, with risk factors, again, differentiation, mitotic count, and the presence of tumor necrosis, and then size, those would be the important things that you would look at, and those give you what your grade is. Again, your survival is dependent upon the type the grade, and the location of a given sarcoma. Now, GISTs are a favorite for testing, okay? So they're the most common sarcoma, the GI tract, 
The stomach is the most common, also is associated with the best prognosis, followed by the small bowel and then the duodenum and the rectum. Once you start to get out of the stomach, that's when you'll see difference differences in the mutational status sometimes. Now, the other thing that is um, incredibly common to know for GIST is that the most common sites are going to be the liver, followed by having dissemination in the peritoneal cavity. They do not go to lymph nodes. So how you do these surgeries is really to make sure you have negative margins. Most GISTs are gonna have the kit mutation, CD117, know both for your test. Only about five to 10% will have the PDG FRA mutation. PD, PDG FRA, right? They'll ask you these questions on the boards. Much, much less commonly, you'll see an SDH mutation. Those are also associated with paragangliomas, and that's part of a genetic syndrome. Again, for GIS, again, tumor size, mitotic rate, and location. Okay, just like all sarcomas, those are the most important things. Now, specifically for GIS, the cutoffs are five centimeters in size and then five mitoses, okay? Then again, when you double it, okay, 10 and then 10 mitoses, that will affect their, their prognosis. If resectable, usually you're gonna do surgery first, followed by adjuvant imitinib. Um, the years, um, it used to be five. Um, you know, I actually forgot to check this morning if it's extended to longer than that. But if there was a question, you want to choose at least five. I think that some of the studies have looked out at 10 years. Um, now, again, for the definitely for your boards, I'm not sure if they'll ask for the absite, but the exon mutation is highly predictive of your response. So again, most people are going to have a kit mutation. So if you have kit, or the PDGFRA mutation, you'll res you'll have responses. However, within the kit mutation, exon 11 has the most responses. Exon 9, it'll still respond, but only 50%. If you had other mutations, you do not get high response rates to imatinib. And imatinib is your first line, and then sinitinib is your second line. And then imatinib, they wouldn't use the brand name, but that's Gleevec which is also used for glioblastomas. So other gastric tumors. They love, love, love to ask about gastric carcinoid tumors, right? So you just need to know type one, type two, and type three. It's This is something that when I was taking, unless they've changed it, I remember them asking every single year, was on my boards, was also on my surgeonc boards. So type one is associated with atrophic gastritis. They're small, they're usually multiple, and they'll look like little polyps. They'll grow slowly and rarely are these gonna metastasize, okay? Think of them as more of a local nuisance. And sometimes some of these, particularly if you catch them in a hypertrophic polyp state, will actually be reversible with correction of the atrophic gastritis. Now type two, again, this is the one that's associated with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome and type one MEN. Okay. Again, usually when these are found, they're multiple and they're small, right? And they're due to a hypergastronemic state. Okay. They grow slowly, but compared to type one, they're more likely to metastasize. And those can be nodal, those can be liver. Now, type three are the most aggressive, and these are these are sporadic. Many times they're found large to be at the time of diagnosis. Because again, if you think about the stomach, you know, something has to be fairly sizable for you to have no symptoms versus type one and type two. Usually people are presenting and they're seen on scopes because they're gonna have some type of symptomatology associated with those conditions. Um, these are the ones, you know, if you see a sporadic gastric carcinoid tumor, you, you, you're definitely gonna be worried about them more again, nodal and liver metastases for carcinoid tumors at the beginning in the, in, at, at the gastric are the, are the most important. Same thing if you have a carcinoid tumor in the ileum, again, um, liver being the most common and lymph nodes for that too. 
Gastric lymphoma, I always remember getting a question about this. Again, this used to be a surgical disease that is no longer the case. Again, it's chemotherapy plus minus radiotherapy. Um, and many times if it's associated with H. pylori and it's an early stage, you can actually see reversal of that, particularly in the case of the malt lymphoma. And again, that's something that, that will be, I remember always being asked that every single year, just one question on that. So again, if you had that, you want to eradicate them with H. pylori, and then you can, then it, the, you do radiation plus minus chemotherapy, depending upon the stage. Um, again, I don't think that they would ask you this and the anti CD20 monoclonal antibody rituximab, um, can be used in this setting as well as rituximab can be used, um, for other types of lymphomas. Now, gastric adenocarcinomas worldwide, huge burden of disease. Um, this is the one where you'll have the, you know, the beetle seeds, salted, pickled, high nitrate type diets, um, H. pylori associated, a three to six fold increase um, in, in patients with gastric cancer, they're found to be seropositive. And again, that etiology behind that is all about chronic inflammation. Familial gastric cancer syndromes, all of these are autosomal dominant, CDH1 mutation in women. You'll also see that in lobular breast. I don't think they'll ask you that for absite surge on boards. They'll definitely ask you that. Lynch syndrome, juvenile polyposis syndrome, putz jaeger FAP. In the United States, less gastric cancer, but a migration up to the GE junction. Signet cells do worse than intestinal subtypes. Intestinal subtypes usually are associated with H. pylori. The workup, you're going to do EUS imaging for staging. If it's resectable, you'll do an upfront laparoscopy to detect clinically occult um, washings. Again, for this year, um, I'm not sure if they'll be as up to date with some of the newer studies that have been um, more popular, really really highlighting even for things that are T1B gastric cancers, the importance of doing a staging laparoscopy with washings and cytology. Lots of choices um, to give patients neoadjuvant treatment. You can do that with chemotherapy and, and that's based on the MAGIC trial. Um, you can give them upfront chemo RADS, um, or you can give treatment in the adjuvant setting. If you look at the NCCN guidelines from this year, again, T1A or in situ, and T1A means confined to the mucosa, okay? Those are really the only people that you should be kind of saying, okay, this is low enough risk, you know, surgically first, um, without really worrying that much about laparoscopy in your mind. Um, if it's in situ, and again, if you were a high volume center, you had really, really skilled people, that's where you talk about things like an endoscopic mucosal resection, much, much, much more common in Asia than in the United States. Again, probably due to expertise and the prevalence um, and probably the subtype too um, in Japan and Korea and in Asia compared to what we see in the, in Western, um, we have much less of the intestinal subtype than, than what's seen in Asia. Again, recommend laparoscopy if the patient's medically fit and resectable. The other things, um, and I think I have it in the other slide. Again, if it's you need to know what the CWIRT category is and you need to memorize what that is. And I'll tell you um, how I keep all of that, that together. The other things that are important to do ahead of time are microsatellite instability. Not only is that important for looking at genetics, but it also is important for response to treatment because people with microsatellite instability actually are candidates, um, irregardless of site, um, for things like immune therapy. Um, HER2, again, gastric cancer, there's probably now about six different subtypes. Um, 
and and those uh, those will respond a little bit differently. And again, PDL one testing. So this stuff over here for the NCCN, that's more for you know if you guys are taking care of patients. Again, I don't think that they'll ask you much more, maybe than making sure that you understand the component of microsatellite instability. And again, remember that's important even if it's not a Lynch patient, um, whether or not you have microsatellites instability. Again, this just kind of walks you through that. Um, you guys can take a look. If you give people um, preoperative treatment, again, just know to restage them um, with, the, with the PET CT or CT chest, abdomen, pelvis. Now, with whenever you have three things to memorize, a good rule of thumb is only memorize the one in the middle. Right. So when we're talking about gastric adenocarcinoma and anatomy, again, you need to know if it's CWIRT 1, 2, or 3. CWIRT 1 is going to be managed with an esophageal cancer paradigm. Most places will manage CWIRT Part 2 again during that, but that's a little controversial. CWIRT Type 3 is always treated as a gastric cancer. So CWIRT Type 2, if you think about it, it's one centimeter, the, the center portion of the tumor is situated one centimeter above the GE junction or two centimeters below. So you know that, and then for CWIRT type one, five up, for CWIRT type three, five down, okay? But just rec just memorize what CWIRT type two is. It's fair, fair game, because it's a fact, right? Facts are always easier for them to test than kind of management questions, unless it's super straightforward. Um, the classic teaching, right, depending upon the location, you know, you'll wind up with a total, subtotal, or a distal gastrectomy. Classic teaching, again, for gastric cancer is five centimeter margins. The lymphadenectomy that you should do is a D2 without the spleen, okay? And you want to have at least 16 nodes in your sample per the NCCN guidelines. Again, going to go over it again because it's important. CDH1 mutation, women for hereditary gastric cancer, it's autosomal dominant, again, Again, women with lobular carcinoma of the breast. Lynch syndrome, again, you guys need to know, particularly these first three here, MLH1, MSH2 slash 6. You have to know this, right? Lynch is so common, right? They're going to ask you about it. Juvenile polyposis syndrome, particularly SMAD4. There's another mutation, but that's the one that's really important for gastric cancer. Putz Jaeger, right? You need to know the STK11. And FAP, you need to know that the, the gene involved is APC. These familial syndromes, again, really, really easy for them to ask you those questions. So it's one of those things like right before you take the test, you like you glance at and hope that you remember it. Again, just when we're talking about the lymphadenectomy, a D1 lymphadenectomy really are the nodes that are the closest to the stomach that if you were going to take out the stomach, that would easily come out. D2, really think about things that are centered around the celiac axis and its branches. And again, if you were to look at this in three dimensions, if you flip up the stomach, you want to take those lymph nodes on their way to the spleen. And again, when you're actually doing a gastrectomy, um, you have all of that mobilized. So, you know, you just want to take all of that fatty tissue and skeletonize those vessels. Patients get more appropriately staged. And again, the magic number for gastric cancer on current recommendation is 16 or more that you've done an adequate lymphadenectomy. With this too, just know, so these gastroepiploic lymph nodes, remember, in, you actually have the omentum hanging down. So you make sure to take the omentum with that. All right, so I'm going to take a breath and just do a quick potpourri. So the cell cycle, I remember, was kind of a, something that was always asked. Um, you know, just know what happens during all of these types, um, all, all of the phases in cell synthesis. Now, here on the outside, you know, you can see some of the common mutations, um, particularly with the uh, kinase dependent interactions that, you know, so for example, over here, right, P53 mutation, P16 mutation, right, CDK46, these are super, super common things that you'll see um, for cancer. And, you know, knowing that they happen in G1, and again, G1 is the longest phase, right, you see the, the, the most amount of things there. Um, other, the cyclins usually are going to be um, cyclin 2, and 
they may not ask you this, but this over here, right? Just know G1, you have P53, CDK46, and P16, okay? Uh, and as you guys know, P16 can be important for HPV-associated cancers. Again, exhaustive list, um, just up here more for reference, but again, things that are important, right? You need to know herb mutation with EGFR, um, HER1, herb B2 for HER2 new, right? Things that are really, really common. Again, you'll hear more about that probably when you have your breast, um, but EGFR, right? We have targeted therapies, right? It's a really common pathway, so make sure you know that. The, um, the RET oncogene, right? You're going to get that with endocrine, right, for your MEN um, and medullary thyroid cancer, um, KRAS, right? Super common gene mutated lung, colon, pancreas. BRAF is specific really for melanoma. Um, and again, the list goes on and on. Uh, the BCR ABLE um, translocation, again, that's a real common one asking about CML, AL, ALL, and AML. Um, and then um, Ewing sarcoma with uh, this translocation down here. Again, those from my my many years having to take this exam, those were really the ones that were highlighted. Again, another non-exhaustive list of tumor suppressor genes with inherited susceptibility. Again, P10 mutation, RB1, P53. Again, sometimes they'll ask you, again, up here on the slide before, these are oncogenes versus here, these are tumor suppressor genes. Um, and again, most of you'll be familiar with almost all of these, but they could ask you a question like, is BRCA1 and 2 and, you know, the, the mismatch genes, right? Are these tumor suppressor genes or like which one of these aren't? So again, this is kind of one of those things to kind of glance at. And again, if I'd pay attention more to this table, and then if it's not on that table, then say it's an oncogene, right? So just kind of look at the ones that are super common. So I don't think this will be covered anyplace else. So again, just a quick immunology potpourri. Um, so some of this is from what I think is important. And a, I looked at the Behind the Knife podcast of what's the last minute things for you guys to know for the app site. So it's kind of a hodgepodge of these two things. So interferon, alpha and beta, think about this as antiviral. So Again, how does the immune system attack viruses, right? You need to upregulate up -regulate your MHC class one in order to um, be able to recognize self versus non-self. Um, the interferon is also was a treatment for um, hepatitis, um, you know, some somewhat treatment still now for multiple sclerosis. But again, for that, just think a bit about antiviral action and upregulation of MHC class one. Now, interferon, Baron gamma, that just like IL-2 is kind of a really major and important cytokine for actually your effector immune response. Again, it'll be released by most of your antigen presenting cells, right? So macrophages, dendritic cells. Again, what that's doing is it's communicating to the rest of the, the immune system and cells to upregulate MHC class one and two, which you need to mount effect, effective effector um, responses. TH1 differentiation, again, important in antiviral defenses, right? So that's really the gas pedal of your immune system. Now, GCSF, when you have granulocytopenia, right, neutrophils. Now, GMCSF, remember, like that's a like neupogen that people will get. So um, know the GMCSF. Um, and that if you give that, that's neupogen, which is how you treat chemo-associated uh, neutropenia. TNF-alpha, again, is a big inflammatory mediator. Again, that's kind of, you know, you get your COVID shot, your TNF-alpha levels are through the roof. So all of us, you've been vaccinated, right? Fever, you know, coagulation, um, right? If you're mounting a big response, you can get hypoglycemic, cachexic. So, you know, end-stage tumor patients to have that in your mind, those patients, their TNF alpha levels are sky high. Um, 
and TNF alpha in infection. Okay, it's a major mediator of septic shock, right? Basodilate decreases cardiac function eventually, um, a bad actor with a host of different effects. Now, the other potpourri, so IL-1, just think about fever, right? And, and always associate fever with macrophages. That's an easy way to remember it. Again, IL-2, activated T cells and NK cells. Um, you know, right now, I don't think they'd ask you, you know, but you can still use it for uh, renal cell cancer. We actually use IL-2 still when we're doing adoptive T cell therapies for some other types of cancers. Um, Anti-IL-2 receptor is one of those things that sometimes is used as induction when people get a transplant, okay? But again, for IL-2, think T cells, NK cells, again, one of those gas pedal type of cytokines. IL-4, for purposes of the ab site, Think about it associated with uh, B cells and the conversion of B cell to plasma cells. If you remember, the plasma cells are the ones that actually make the antibodies. And you guys need to know your antibody classes. You need to know what IgG is, IgM, IgA, and IgE. Okay, it's going to be asked all the time, right? Your IgG that crosses the placenta, that's most of your the antibodies that you have longer term. IgE, right, parasites as well as um, the the hypersensitivity response, IgA, that's your mucosa. That's, you know, kind of where people are saying vaccination intranasally, right? Mucosa, you get more IgA. Um, and then IgM is the biggest one and usually early, right? I, IgG is going to be a little bit later. But again, that's th these kind of these, uh, the antibodies, they ask you all the time. So just know them. IL-6, um, just think about acute phase reaction, okay? In the liver, a lot of the things that we're measuring as inflammatory markers are actually upregulated by IL-6. Um, and, you know, again, with COVID, you guys may have been treating people with tocilizumab, and that's actually what IL-6, it's an anti-IL-6 agent. It's also super useful in uh, refractory uh, colitis in patients who fail steroids and, uh, and Humira. Um, the tocilizumab works really well in those folks um, for anyone associate, anyone interested in immune therapy. Um, IL-8, again, just think about neutrophils, attracting them and angiogenesis. And IL-10, just think of it as a, like a total immune system um, break. Best way to think about that. And again, there's always questions about these cytokines. So again, it's one of the things to look at, you know, maybe the night before, or, you know, if you're not on call that day, you know, right before you walk into your app site. Um, the only other thing um, is, again, I think you guys will get transplant later, so they'll probably go into this a little bit more, but, um, you know, like your type four uh, hypersensitivity response and like serum sickness type thing, right? That's chronic transplant re re rejection. That's going to be mediated by, uh, by T cells and over a longer term. Um, I don't think that they'd ask you all of these things, but again, I think that they do like to ask you, and again, I think you get transplant later, like how the different drugs work. So this, this is always, I just found this to be a really good summary slide that uh, from Janeway's uh, immunology text and the, the clinical immunology text that really summarizes this really nicely. And I remember them always asking you know, about the transplant drugs. You're going to have a question about how antibiotics work. So again, if you if if you invest the 10 minutes to remember it, you know that's going to be a couple of questions um, that you'll just get right. And again, you know the time investment for those are you know when you're looking at something to study at the last minute, right? You're not going to learn all of oncology in one night, but you can you know maybe cram in a couple of these other hypersensitivity responses, how drugs work, some of those genetic mutations, and with that. Um, I know I spoke super fast, and this is a lot of material, um, but I am uh, I am done.